Novus, the new voice. Vox Novus, the new dimension. Vox Novus, thought and movement leaders who will share from their experience and offer tools to help us navigate our rapidly changing world. My name is Victor Furman. Welcome to Vox Novus, the new voice. June 26th is Forgiveness Day. Is it possible to both forgive everyone who may have hurt you, as well as offer forgiveness to those that you may have hurt? My guest this week on Vox Novus, Dimitri Moraitis, says that there are divine forgiveness principles that promote healing and brighten your aura. Dimitri Moraitis has been helping souls grow at the Spiritual Arts Institute, the school he co-founded with the Mozart of Metaphysics, Barbara Martin. This nonprofit is known by thousands of students around the world as the premier metaphysical school. He is co-author of the international bestseller, Change Your Aura, Change Your Life. You can learn more about his work at spiritualarts.org. He joins me this week to share his path and the power of divine forgiveness. Please join me in welcoming to Vox Novus, Dimitri Moraitis. Welcome, Dimitri. Well, thank you for having me on. It's a pleasure. Dimitri, thank you so much for joining us and sharing your work and this important message. My condolences on the recent passing of Barbara Y. Martin, your partner in the Spiritual Arts Institute and co-author of the just-published third edition of the international best-selling book, Change Your Aura, Change Your Life. Please tell us about Barbara, how you met, and the amazing spiritual work that you manifested together. Oh, thank you so much. Yes, um, uh, Barbara was truly one of the pioneers of metaphysics. I don't know if metaphysics would be exactly where it is today without people like her. Uh, and they did it. She did it at a time when it wasn't popular. There was the idea of doing like what we're doing now would have been unheard of when she first started. As a matter of fact, when she first got offered to do a, a paid workshop or lecture on the aura, she said, I dropped the phone. I couldn't believe somebody <laughs> wanted that to happen. So it gives you an idea. You know, she was uh, born of the greatest generation and was essentially born seeing the aura. Um, from a very early age, she started seeing it. But she didn't quite understand what it all meant, except she could tell when she was attracted to something or, or not so attracted to somebody. Um at age 11, she got her first actual training. She was in a theater company, and the woman called her in, you know, the leader quietly one day and said, basically, you can see the aura. And Barbara, again, mouth dropped. Is that what it's called? They didn't even have a name for it. it. She didn't even know what it was called. And she said, I'm a hermetic scientist. I can see the aura, too, and I'd like to teach you about your gifts. And she started to teach her how to interpret the energies and understand what it is and the family moved to california where the her father was a greek orthodox priest and a builder of churches and they were building the church in pasadena and the mother said well we're staying here <laughs> I, I love it here we're not you go where the diocese sends you we're gonna keep working here um and then as an adult she met another great mystic and this woman kind of prepared her for the rigors of actually teaching um, and she became a teacher, marvelous teacher. Oh, my God, the the way she taught. I had my own awakening. I came to California for movies. And um, I was very much in the creative spirit, but not metaphysical. And I did have this profound spiritual awakening. And about a year afterwards, I met her at a dinner party. And I knew that first night this was my teacher. Um, we started working right away. Um and it wasn't just student. She involved me in her kind of her mission work. And then we also discovered we loved to write. You know, we both were good writers. So we started writing projects together. And at some point, she had had so much uh, uh, notes and, you know, a lot of things that came through inspiration. I said, well, we've got to organize all of this. And she had also notes for the Change Your Aura book, but it wasn't finished yet. So we really got together. We got that going. And that launched the whole organization and what i didn't realize at the time it was going to launch my in a sense my own career as a teacher she was preparing me she's a generation ahead of me uh to to continue the work when her 
when her tenure is done. So these last 25 years of having the Institute and all that's part of it have been just, I don't know, one of the greatest blessings of my life. Please share with us what it was like that when you met her and and inspired you to to move forward with this. Had you been interested in this field before? Not before. So, but a year before, I was having, kind of leading up, I was having these, I was just calling them my inspiration moments. I was in this sort of heightened state of awareness and just very insightful. And it was kind of like the, the wind. It came and went by itself. And sometimes it happened in very odd places. It, 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 so... But at one point, it got so strong. It, it was a, this, I call it my Saul on the road to Damascus moment. It was a, a, but even then, I didn't have the word metaphysical, but I knew something had fundamentally changed. And when I realized this was metaphysics, I couldn't get enough of it. And then, I, but I was careful. I didn't join a group. I was just studying a lot and actually talking a lot. I was so excited about all the things that were, was, I was experiencing. And at the dinner party, she led a meditation, and that literally was the first time I meditated. It was like literally this ancient door opening. And then afterwards, I did start kind of pouring my heart out because I had all these questions. And I don't know, I thought we had a great conversation. Barbara joked, oh, you interrogated me that first night. <laughs> um, but as she was talking, she was giving language to what I was experiencing. And then I realized, you know, she was talking from her own experiences, and just by the end of the evening, I knew it. I, I knew she was the one. Out of curiosity, what was your age at that time when you first met her and this started? 25, 26. And then, you know, I think it was, I was 25 had my awakening and 26 I met her. Because a lot of us, in, in my case in particular, my spiritual reawakening happened in my mid-30s, and it happened explosively. I started uh, studying uh, many different topics and many different things, and it just it was life-changing for me at that point. Yeah, well, wherever it happens now, I at the time I was uh, I was just building my career, and I was not yet you know married. So uh, the Bible says, "Seek God early." You know, but it happens whenever it's meant to happen. Some people they have it in their fifties, you know, or there's a tragedy that kind of gets them on the road. Others, from the time they're born, maybe it's not a dramatic awakening, but it sounds like in your case it was a a real inflection point. But the most important thing is you paid attention to it. You didn't, you know, one of the things you really encourage people, if you've had your awakening, that's not an accident. That's the divine knocking on your door, and you want to do everything you can to follow through on that. Tell us what inspired Change Your Aura, Change Your Life, and what's offered to readers in that book? That book is something Barbara was working on for years, because she is one of the world's foremost, or was one of the world's foremost clairvoyants. And she could see the aura and the depth that was just uncanny. Um, but again, there was no there was no book, you know. And so we started working on it. And I thought, well, we've got the encyclopedia here. This thing's going to write itself. But it took two years. It was not an immediate thing. And then we were pretty early into it. We realized, well, wait a minute. You know what? This actually isn't an aura book. It's an aura on meditating with the aura. It's a, it's a book on how to meditate to change your aura. And when we realized that was really, you know, as you'd call it in the in the, <laughs> the hook, then the book then started really falling into place. So we tell people this book tells the world what we do. We meditate with divine light. And that's been the cornerstone of Barbara's work. It should be great to know what your colors are and to know we have an auric field. But if you can't do anything about it, where's the useful aspect of that knowledge and the idea is the aura is changing and to create anything in your life it's got to show up in your aura first so you if it's not if you're not happy with where things are in your life well you just got to start changing the energy in your aura and then by divine law it'll it'll start showing up in your life as i had mentioned in the introduction to this interview this month marks national forgiveness day in my work as an interfaith minister, I've officiated many funerals. One of the expressions I often hear from the grieving is regret for not forgiving or asking for forgiveness from those who have transitioned before they passed. As you share, it's not always easy to forgive or ask for forgiveness, but if we don't, we bog ourselves and our auras down. 
What are some divine forgiveness principles around why it's spiritually prudent to forgive and to ask for forgiveness? Wow. You know, that's so true what you say about when people grieve for those that passed on, because if there is unfinished business, you're not only grieving for the person lost, you realize, oh, there's no more time. It's over. And now you can still ask for forgiveness, even, shall we say, beyond the grave. But it's not always easy to do that. Um, now, a lot of people, the problem with forgiveness is people think, well, I'm not going to let that person off the hook. And they forget it's not about letting the other person off the hook, ironically. It's about letting yourself off the hook. Forgiveness is one of the great purifiers of love. When you don't forgive somebody, you're holding yourself in the energy of whatever happened, whether you were the one that committed the offense or someone else did. I'm sure you've heard some of these stories, but one we we, we tell here is during those horrifying years of the you know, Nazi concentration camps, there was a, a woman that survived it. And um, she became very religious afterwards and really worked on years for forgiveness. Of a, we can't even begin to imagine, you know, what she went through. Um, and years later, she's at some public event. And who does she see but this one particular jailer that was particularly abusive to her? He's still alive, and he's at the same public event. And she said, the minute I saw him, the first thing I wanted to do was just kill him right on the spot. But then these years of practicing forgiveness and all that started to kick in. And she said, it took every ounce of courage I had. I walked up to him. He recognized me. And I spoke right to his face. And I said, I forgive you for everything you did to me. And she said, I meant every word of it. Now, what's the most interesting thing is what she reported afterwards. She said that was the first I felt my initial reaction after doing that was relief. I felt relief for the first time since it happened. In other words, it took her, yes, 10, 15 years to really let it go. But she freed her soul. Now, in our work, we talk about things like karma of course, he's going to have to work out his karma for what he did, but he won't have to do it with her because she let that situation go. So the ability, and it is a process, you you can't, you know, if you say, oh, I forgive you, but then you keep talking about all the, the things they did, you haven't really forgiven yet, right? So forgiveness is really a soul thing, and it can take a while. I mean, that woman that uh, survived the Rwandan genocide, you know, the famous story in she saw her family butchered in front of us. I mean, these are offenses that we can't even begin to imagine, right? Um, she, now, she didn't know metaphysics, but she just said the resentment was eating me alive. Mm. So all that she did was she just started, I think at one point she said it was 12 hours a day. She just started doing the forgiveness, forgiveness, forgiveness. And somehow she hit that, she hit that ability to actually let it go. And... Again, that was her, her her freedom from all that happened. So, my goodness, if people can forgive that, we can forgive the slights that were done to us. And then if we're the ones that committed the offense, we have to be really sincere to say, I'll do anything to set the record straight. And you, you can't just say, okay, I tried, but they were still mad at me. That's not even trying. If it was a serious offense then you've got to really give it your all and really show that other person you really mean it. Now, interestingly enough, in the aura, forgiveness comes through as a pink light. When you're really able to do it, when you're really able to get into that zone. and But it can take a while to make it happen, which is one of the reasons it's better. What do we they say? Forgive quickly. If you're able to let it go, soon after it happened, it's easier because what happens with time is we start to not embellish it, but we start to relive it. And every time we relive it, we're kind of building this monster inside of us. So there's the initial offense, 
but then there's all the things we started to think about. Let's say, okay, something terrible happened to me at five years old, but I'm a five-year-old kid, right? So I dealt with it at the moment, but I'm remembering it at 10. I'm remembering it at 15. What am I doing? I'm starting now to add to it. Oh, you see how horrible that person was? You're building the resentment, and it becomes almost like um, crystallized in the auric field, and it becomes harder to let it go. So the sooner you can say goodbye to it, the you are saving yourself so much grief and anguish. Some might say there are acts so egregious, and what happened during the Holocaust would be one of them, mm -hmm. that forgiveness is impossible. How would you answer this? Well, of course, when we give examples like that, we are talking, you know, extreme scenarios. But again, there were people that went through that and actually forgave. In another scenario like this, there was two people and they were kind of friends and they survived the Holocaust. And this one woman, she started writing these letters, not that she was going to actually send them, but these are letters of forgiveness. And again, she somehow found that place where she could let it go. Her friend took the opposite, said, I will never forgive them as long as I live. And her daughter reported, not only have I never heard my mother laugh, I've never even seen her smile. Yeah. So what does that mean? You're still in that concentration camp. You know, that the point is, do you, do you want to stay in the moment of what happened to you because these are these are experiences. That's not who we are. We are this immortal soul, and we're going to go through these experiences. Maybe not again. That, that, that's extreme things we're talking about. But we see other things in other eras. There are other genocides that happen. You know, in in I mean, look at last century. How many horrifying things happened? Whether it was in Europe, whether it was in Russia, all that happened in China. You know, these millions of people wiped out. There has to be some bigger law going on here, something bigger than ourselves. And you as an interfaith minister will know you also can't take God out of the equation. Absolutely. You know, we have to realize there's a bigger picture here than what we can see from our subjective point of view. Absolutely. I had a spiritual teacher, a wonderful man, at the New Seminary of New York back in the 1990s, and he lost his wife and only child in the Holocaust. No, oh, And gosh. he used to say, I can never forgive what the Nazis did, but I will not hate because hatred is like taking poison and expecting the other person to die. He really said it well. He really said it well. Uh, he also, in a sense, had a sense of the auric field because there's a lot going on with the aura when you don't forgive. Um, you know, there are what we call enlightened aspects of the aura, where there are these beautiful, bright colors. There are these unenlightened, you know, our jealousies, our hatreds, our angers. Those show up in the auric field, too, and they're menacing to ourselves. Um, Barbara was doing a lecture years ago, an aura lecture, and uh, she noticed, well, she was friends with this woman in the front row, and this woman had brought her uncle there. He didn't really want to be there, and he didn't believe any of this stuff. Uh, but she started to look at the uncle's aura, and she goes, oh, my God, there's this horrendous black energy in there. And she picked up, he's trying to, he's contemplating murdering his his wife. Mm. It's in his aura, you know. So afterwards, she talked to him. I mean, she, Barbara talked to the niece. And somehow, I don't know what happened, but there was some serious stuff going on. The point I'm making here is these things linger in the auric field. So what happens when something terrible happens to us? Um, we have the memory of the experience, but we have something else that gets locked in our subconscious. We have our reaction to the memory. So in other words, there's the energy of the experience itself but then there's the energy of how we reacted to that. So if it was anger, hatred, terror, whatever it was, that gets locked in our subconscious as well. And when we retrieve the experience, we also retrieve our reaction to it. And But unfortunately, we end up also building on it because it, it, 
it creates a re-reaction. It's like we relive it all again. And then, but we're in the safety now. We're not in that situation. So we're reliving it, but now we can almost even make it worse without realizing that we're doing it. Which again is why it's so important to, to let it go, put it in God's hands. Your goal is you want to live your life. You want to do the best job that you can. And these things are in hands greater than our own. One of the questions we asked about that time, since we seem to be talking about it a little bit, is, you know, some have talked about the idea of karma, you know, that there is a, uh, the, if you believe in reincarnation, that were they paying back a karmic debt? Well, what the inspiration we got from it here was, well, there may have been some cases where that was true, but most of them that was not the case. But because they went through such a horrendous experience, whatever other karma they had for that life, it was exonerated. So in other words, they still progressed in that life, even though it had such a horrifying end. So there's something we have to remember. It, with God, there is always justice in what does appear like many times a very unjust world. And what's important is that we live with the dignity that we know we need to live. We leave the rest up to God, and then things will take care of itself. My guest is Dimitri Moraitis. We're talking about forgiveness on this month, which contains National Forgiveness Day. Dimitri, please tell our listeners about the Spiritual Arts Institute and Change Your Aura, Change Your Life, the 25th anniversary edition. Well, thank you. Um, we have a, a, a center here in Southern California near San Diego called Spiritual Arts Institute, but we also do courses and workshops online. We've been doing um, video conferencing long before the, the Zoom era. Um, and spiritualarts.org is our website. And we have, of course, the Change Your Aura book is now everywhere, but we have also other books on metaphysics too. Um, so we encourage you to either go to the website or Check us out online. And the website is? Spiritualarts.org. Yeah, we are a nonprofit. Spiritualarts.org. Thank you for sharing that. And we'll be back with more after these words on the Ohm Times Radio Network. The best of the holistic, spiritual, and conscious world. Ohm Times Radio. IOM FM. Ohm Times Magazine is one of the leading online content providers of positivity, wellness, and personal empowerment. A philanthropic organization, their net proceeds are funneled to support worldwide charity initiatives via Humanity Healing International. Through their commitment to creating community and providing conscious content, they aspire to uplift humanity on a global scale. Ohm Times, co-creating a more conscious lifestyle. Hello, I'm Sandy Sedgbeer, host of Ohm Times Magazine's flagship radio show, What is Going On? My passion is sifting through information, research and innovations from new thought teachers, speakers and researchers pushing back the boundaries of what we know about life, energy, metaphysics and the universe. I love shifting perceptions about who we are, why we're here and how quickly impossible becomes normal when we open our minds, expand our awareness and accept that the only limits that exist are those we place upon ourselves. So if you're the kind of forward-thinking, eager investigator of what lies beyond the current reality that most perceive, why not make a date to come play with me in the field of possibilities at 4 p.m. Pacific Time, 7 p.m. Eastern Time every Thursday, and together we can discover what's really going on. Back on Vox Novus, my guest this week is Dimitri Moraitis. We're talking about the Spiritual Arts Institute, the book Change Your Aura, Change Your Life, and also about forgiveness. What happens spiritually when we offer forgiveness? Well, when we really mean it, right? So there's a process of forgiving. Um, sometimes we have to be mindful and that we're, okay, I'm starting to forgive you. But since it is a soul thing to really let it go, um, the mind can't always dictate it. So what we say, there's kind of three keys we help people here. One we've already shared with, forgive quickly, right? The more, the quicker you do it, the more it'll help. The second is forgive and forget. Um, meaning if you are drudging up, you say you're forgiven, but you still drudge up the issue, 
then you know you haven't fully done it yet, but you need to keep working at it. Then there's the one that's kind of from the Bible, forgive 70 times 7. Well, what does this mean? Well, let's say you're in a relationship and your spouse or whatever's done something not kind or whatever. Well, if the spouse hasn't learned their lesson, it's chances are they're going to do it again. So if you say, look, I forgive you this time, but if you ever do it again, I'll never forgive you. That's still not forgiveness. So in our work, we do a lot of meditating uh, and prayer work. We actually, we call it meditative prayers. And one of the energies that is indispensable when it comes to forgiveness is the energy of love. Forgiveness is an act of love, divine love. It's your way of freeing yourself and in, in helping others in the process by the act of forgiveness. But it is also an act of love. So if you are having trouble letting something go, letting a slight go, then working with that, meditating with that deep rose pink can help you get into that more loving expression where it's easier. Now, if it's the other way around and you're the one asking forgiveness, now, interesting, we have a we have a prayer we do. We call it the forgiveness prayer. And then this forgiveness prayer, regardless if you're the one that um, did the offense or the other person, we always include both ways. I ask forgiveness for everything I may have done, and I forgive you for anything that you may have done. So, for example, let's say my spouse has an affair, and I'm really resenting it. So I go into this prayer to let it go, well, why would I uh um why would I ask forgiveness? They did it to me. Yeah, but maybe you played a part and you start thinking, you know what? I didn't give her any attention. I was ignoring the signs. I really wasn't being a very good husband. It wasn't a good thing that she did, but I didn't make it easier. So forgive me if I did anything for you to you that did anything that elicited what happened. So by kind of making it reciprocal, it helps to really Put the whole situation on the divine altar and let it go. Because you do not want a lifetime to end with you having not forgiven or you having asked forgiveness. Because it will, in a sense, leave unfinished business. Barbara tells of a great story. She went to one of these kind of churches where they kind of communicate with the other side. And there, at one point, she said, this man, I mean, the, the medium or whoever was, was saying, there's somebody here that's coming from the other side, and they are begging forgiveness. And he starts describing, and she, she said, the woman in the front row turned beet red. It was the husband that had died from the other side coming back, asking the wife that was sitting in the front row, forgive me. And she turned and she said, I'll never forgive that SOB as long as I live. I mean, he was on the other side. It was over but she was holding on to that anger. And he had obviously been seeing the mistake of his way, and he was begging her, please forgive me, I'm so sorry for what I did. So that's how deep resentments can go, and that's the problem. These are like these, these roots that dig deep, and you just have to be patient and persistent to pull it all out, but there is, like that woman described, a sense of genuine release, and and freedom, you are freeing yourself. You're not letting the other person off the hook. They will still have to atone for whatever they did, but they won't have to do it with you. And that way you can go on with your life. You don't want to be like that woman that never even smiled or laughed. What kind of a life is that? Mm. Right? You want to be able to let that go, and especially when you're raising children, be there. you want to be able to be present where you are now, not living in some memory of the past. When you describe that couple, you're really talking about taking mutual responsibility for forgiveness. Yeah, 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 yeah. There's there's a lot there. And also, again, because we believe in things like karma and reincarnation, you don't know how deep it goes. Let's say two people didn't work it out in a past life, and now they're coming back to work it out in a future life, and you're still holding on to this resentment. There was, in one of our work, we were working with a woman that couldn't 
understand why her mother was, you know, not treating her well and not giving her the respect she thought she deserved. And we did some karma and Barbara said, well, this is karmic. And then she discovered in a past life, she was the husband, the mother was the wife, and she as the husband abandoned the family, leaving them destitute. Centuries later, this, this mother, now the mother, was unconsciously still holding that resentment. So it appeared like, well, mama isn't being good, but it realized, oh, I've got a role to play here. My role is to return unkindness with kindness, to realize there's something deeper here. And she said again, she was so frustrated in the first couple sessions, but when she got the, the real picture, again, there was this sense of freedom, a sense of also empowerment. Oh, I can really do something about this. And we've had this many times in people working with karma where they think, oh, it's this person over here, and they, they don't ever look at themselves to see what maybe I'm contributing in all of this. And by changing myself, you start to notice a change in others. You had mentioned the prayer. Could you share that with us? Yes, I'd be happy to. It, it is in the Change Your Aura book. So what we um, actually, it's kind of a prayer in a process. So you kind of get it. Now, first of all, you've got to be in a pretty steady place for this. So if, if you're just thinking how mad you are at somebody, you know, there's other things you can do to calm down. But once you feel in a pretty centered place, you get into the meditative state and you see yourself in this protective golden bubble and you envision the person that you're forgiving or asking forgiveness of seated in front of you and you're to the best of your ability are doing it without any sense of emotion. And you're seeing them in a protective bubble of light and divinely supported. And then to the best of your ability, you say, I ask forgiveness for anything I may have done that injured you in word, thought, act, or deed, knowingly and unknowingly. And you hold for a moment to feel that you really are sensing that. And then you do the compliment. And I forgive you for anything that you may have done to me that injured me in word, thought, act, or deed, knowingly and unknowingly. I ask that all these negative energies be dissolved in the holy fires of eternal love, freeing us completely in God's divine light and everlasting peace. And then you envision them getting up and walking away in the light, and as you do, you have the sense of exactly that, freeing you and freeing me. It's a marvelous exercise that can really help. I've been doing and teaching this since Barbara taught it almost 40 years ago. And readers can find that in Change Your Aura, Change Your Life. That's a beautiful prayer. Thank you for sharing that. Hmm? My pleasure. I had a, a very interesting situation as my spiritual path was reopening in my mid to late 30s. I was attending a series of gatherings uh, at a, at a uh, house in Brooklyn where this uh, woman who was well into her 80s at the time uh, would bring in speakers on various metaphysical topics. Mm. And uh, at one of these occasions, the speaker, what the speaker was sharing did not resonate with me. Okay. And this woman picked up on that. She noticed it. <laughs> and at the end of the evening, as everyone was leaving, she said, would you stay for a moment? And I said, absolutely. Wonderful woman. And after everybody had left, uh, she came over to me like a mom, took my hands, looked into my eyes. She said, Victor, I know that what this gentleman was sharing tonight didn't sit with you or didn't resonate with you. But let me share something with you. I have learned that God does not require we all be holy, but God would love for us to be whole. Oh. And when she said that, it completely opened and changed my path. Wow. Wow. And well, I think that's sort of what we're talking about here. Mm -hmm. It's about embracing that which is working for you, letting go of that which does not work for you, and moving forward in the higher knowledge. Wow, she's quite an astute soul. In yeah. the wholeness, yeah. Those were Friday night salons at this woman's Salons, oh, yeah, okay. salons. Yeah, I couldn't remember the word before, but salons, yeah. Sounds very European. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, let's discuss other aspects of the aura. What happens to the aura when we are angry, and how may we cleanse this? 
Yes, as, as Barbara would teach, one strong outburst of anger can linger for two weeks in the auric field if left unattended. Two weeks. So now, in the aura, it comes through as like a fire, and I mean a real anger, and not just you know a little irritation. Um, it comes through almost like a firecracker type energy, and it's a dirty, uh, vitiated means a dirtied red, like a very dark, dirty maroon red. And it is not a pleasant energy in the auric field. And, you know, sometimes we know people, they can just seem to get angry at the drop of a hat, right? Uh, and what it is is, okay, I get really angry at somebody. An hour later, though, my mind is directed somewhere else, so I'm not, I'm not thinking about the anger, but emotionally, it's still there. So, again, there's that letting go, right? Okay, you got mad today. Okay, maybe I got a little bit of that vitiated red, but I want to turn it around. I, I tell myself now, I don't have the luxury of an unenlightened emotion. You know, I'm Greek. That's my background. Greeks are very emotional. They're very dramatic. And, you know, but you realize, is it really a good idea just to, you know, be unbridled? You know, you're, there's, you're creating everything through energy, resentment and frustration and fear. Are they really productive? And is it worth the effort? Because that means I have to clear it out. It took energy to be upset. I have to rebuild my aura. Better to just focus on the things you want to create. What are the effects of dependence on others, on our aura, and our spiritual well-being? Well, of course, we're here to support each other, right? We love each other. We may even die for each other. But uh, as Barbara would teach, in the end, our only obligation is to God. We are on this world, but not really of it. We, it's a visit. We're, we're all here for a certain amount of time. And the problem is when you look at somebody let's say, as your source of love, then you can get very jealous, you can get very possessive, because you feel, well, if they're not here, my love is gone. But if you realize somebody is a channel of love, not the source, of course you're going to love them more dear, you're going to love them dearly. But if for some reason that door were closed, that channel could come through another way. So you've got to let the river flow. Now, one other thing that Barbara has emphasized so much through the years of working with the aura, we do have these chakra points in the body. And there's a chakra point by our navel, which is uh, connected to our emotions. And when she'd look at the chakras, most often she would say the weakest one is the emotional. Because many times people don't know how to handle their emotions. And they don't even understand the purpose of emotion spiritually. And if someone is pulling on you, or if you're leaning to them, that often is done from this emotional center, right? We've all had that experience. Uh, we Someone comes to us and kind of cries on our shoulder and, you know, just especially with something serious, you're there for them, but they go away. They say, gee, I feel so much better. I'm so glad I came and you're ready to crawl into bed. You're done because they kind of pulled on your energy. In the same way, you want to work with each other, but you don't want to be de de energetically dependent. You want to build your own bridge. And there is this other chakra point above our head. It's not even in the body. It's about two feet above the head, the higher self point, we call it. And this is your contact point with the divine. So we're meant to exchange energies with each other, do things with each other, but draw your sustenance directly from the divine. And what about people who are people pleasers and run around taking care of everyone else except for themselves? Well, of course, there's obvious problems there. What happens if you get into trouble and you need help? We've got to remember there's the takers and the givers sometimes, right? We have the priest and all they want to do is just take. And we know that's not good. But if all you're doing is giving, you are denying somebody else their opportunity to give to you. Interestingly enough, when Barbara very first started her classes, she didn't charge any money for it. She just started doing them. And the hire came in and said, don't do that. You need to charge because you're hurting their prosperity. They weren't talking about hers. They were saying, "There's if there's not a healthy exchange of energy, then that's not balanced. 
they need to compensate you because of what you're doing for them. So you've got to allow others to do things for you. And you've got to let the energy be balanced. Absolutely. My guest, Dimitri Moraitis of the Spiritual Arts Institute and co-author of the 25th anniversary edition of Change Your Aura, Change Your Life. We'll be back with more after these words on the OM Times Radio Network. Humanity Healing International is a small nonprofit with a big dream. Since 2007, HHI has been working tirelessly to bring help to communities with little or no hope. Our projects are not broad mandates, nor are they overnight solutions, but they bring the reassurance that no one is alone and that someone cares. To learn more, please visit HumanityHealing.org. Humanity Healing is where your heart is. Imagine yourself being transported to India, to the banks of the Ganga, and an ashram in Rishikesh. Visualize that you are welcome to satsang with an American sannyasi who shares the wisdom of her guru. Your visualization has manifested. Join Satvi Bhagawati Saraswati for inspiration and transformation every Thursday at 11 a.m. Eastern on OM Times Radio. More than 24 million Americans have an autoimmune disorder, and that number continues to grow. I'm Sharon Saylor, and I'm one of those 24 million. To put that number in perspective, cancer affects about 9 million and heart disease up to 22 million. That's why I've brought together top experts and those thriving regardless of their diagnosis to bring you the latest, most up-to-date information. Join me, Sharon Saylor, Friday night, 7 p.m. Eastern, for the Autoimmune Hour on Life Interrupted Radio to find out how to live your life uninterrupted. So I'm a cat, and I just moved in with this new human, and she's got this little toy she's always playing with all day long. Tap, 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 bloop, bloop. She can't put it down. There it is. Oh, and get this. She even talks to it. Last week, she asked it for Chinese. And guess what? Egg rolls showed up like magic. Humans have cool toys. A person is the best thing to happen to a shelter pet. Be that person. Adopt. Brought to you by the Ad Council and the shelterpetproject.org. We've all felt left out. And for people who move to this country, that feeling lasts more than a moment. We can change that. Learn how at belongingbeginswithus.org. Brought to you by the Ad Council. Back on Vox Novus, my guest this week is Dimitri Moraitis. We're talking about the Spiritual Arts Institute, the book, Change Your Aura, Change Your Life. Dimitri, please tell us about the auric umbilical connection and oh. how this may be cleansed. Oh, that's interesting. Okay, so, well, we all know what an umbilical cord is um, between the mother and the infant child, and it's how the, the child is nourished in the womb. Um, but then it we're, we sever it. Of course, we have to separate the two when the, when the child is born. Um, but there is, with the biological parents, and actually this is even with the, the, the father, there's a spiritual umbilical connection that's formed from one emotional chakra point to another emotional chakra point. And this is because the child needs so much nourishment. Um, and I don't mean just physical nourishment. Um, you know, when the child is born, the, of course, we know they, they can't even really see and they're, they're developing themselves and the aura is developing. The aura actually doesn't get established till seven years old. Uh, and then there's even further stages of development all the way to 16. So the, the parents are doing much more than just rearing. They're, they are actually supporting kind of the, the evolutionary growth of the soul. And this emotional connection uh, from one emotional center to the other is a key way of helping to keep that stability. Uh, it actually does remain with the child to parent until one of them dies. Now, obviously, at, at, at as an adult, it's not as strong. But, you know, especially if you had a good relationship with your parent, you know, gosh, how is it, you know, you know, you know, they may call you and say, is, is everything okay? You know, how did you know? How did you know? They, they've got that sixth sense. And part of it is because there is this connection. Now, it cannot be severed, you know, you're, it's there. But yes, if there is any 
tension between the parent and the child. And I mean, important. I mean, we all get irritated and stuff like that. I, I don't mean that. Uh, you can ask the light to go into that umbilical connection to clear any disturbing vibrations that may be going because we do transmit to each other. We do it even without the umbilical, but the umbilical is there. And this is partly why, of course, the Bible does say honor thy father and mother because from the mystical point of view, um, what is what are the parents doing? They are really helping to usher another soul on to this earth plane to give it a chance to serve its purpose and potential. So the it's the soul in there. You know, there's no such thing as a purely biological pregnancy because it's not just about a body. It's about the soul inhabiting that body. And the Holy Ones have shared, it is one of the most sacred honors to, to be a parent because of this relationship. And okay, you may not be in this lifetime a parent, but it doesn't mean you haven't been it before, and it doesn't mean you can't help children or, or those that are younger, but we really need to respect this relationship more than we do. And I almost think in society, we need to spend more time building and encouraging the family unit, because it is the building block of a civilization. What are some of the other colors connected with the aura? You mentioned pink for forgiveness. What are the other colors, and what do they represent? Oh, my goodness. In the book, we go through a whole color chart. And that was one of the things Dorothy helped Barbara know at 11 years old. So the light colors, well, there's the white light, of course, which means a lot of purity. Gold, if there's gold in your auric field, it means you're a very dynamic individual. You're, you're very outgoing. We need gold in this world, just like we need the loving energy. Purple, peace, peace, the ability to be in a sense of peace, even if things around you are not peaceful, you can have that internal sense of peace. So people with purple in their aura have this internal, you know, sometimes just being around people, you feel just, I feel so relaxed around you because that peaceful energy is there. A very important one in the, in the, for us now is the emerald green ray. That's balance and harmony. So that kind of person, you can't tip their canoe that easy. They have a way of even when curveballs are thrown, they kind of keep their, their energetic stability. And those that can do that have a strong emerald green in the aura. Um, my gosh, I could go on and on. Um, carnation red for vitality. Athletes will have a lot of that in their aura for the stamina they have to do the things they do. Powder blue brings in an inspirational power. So if you're a very artistic, a very creative, a very inventive, you want to bring in that the powder blue to help be in that inspirational state. So there's so many, there are, there are these, in the book we go over 10 power rays that you can work with that are related to aspects of your aura. Is it possible for everyone to see or sense auras and may this gift be developed? So everyone is sensing it already, whether they are aware of it or not, because we all have the clairvoyant potential. It's not necessarily, in, in, in some, of course, it's latent, but even latent, it's still active. So when you get that intuitive prompting, the intuitive hit, that that is your kind of spiritual sensing being activated. So it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when they can be awakened, and most definitely it can be developed, but there is a timing for it. There is a, a rhythm of when it's meant to unfold. What we tell people is, work on your spiritual development, and things like clairvoyance will unfold in its time. You know, Now, if you've had some experience, you, you shared some experiences, you had clairaudiently, sometimes we're born with some of these gifts, you know, and it meant we earned it in a past life, and mm -hmm. it helps us on our journey that we're going on here. Other times we can develop it, but the most important thing, maybe to help kind of sum a little bit today, the key is not being able to, is, the key is not seeing the aura, the key is working with it. You don't need to see the aura to work with it, but by meditating with divine light, with understanding how the aura works, you start to see the changes in your life, and that is the confirmation of its value. In the revised edition of Change Your Aura, Change Your Life, you share that the aura has a rhythm. Please explain. Yep. I've got rhythm. <laughs> 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 yeah. Hopefully I've got rid of them. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, you know, when you see illustrations of the aura, of course, it's like a picture, but the aura moves. 
the aura is dynamic because we're dynamic and they move in different. It's not all the same rhythm. You know, some people would say, well, I don't want to see you today. My aura must be black. No, it's not black. You may have had a bad moment, but there may be some pieces of there that are not so great, but not the whole aura. So some parts of your aura literally change as your thoughts and emotions are changing. Others change more over time. They show what we call a tendency of energy. So let's say you have this beautiful, we call fanny ray in the emotional center. It's pink. It's your loving person. Now, if you get angry at somebody, this other energy may show up. It's it's an active emanation. Maybe it's that vitiated red. But you still got that dominating love energy. Now, if you were getting angry all the time, then that dominating energy, the rhythm there would change. And then you have more work to do. So things unfold in time. And this is why you want to live in divine rhythm. When you get, oh, you know what? I really should take care of this today. I now do it tomorrow. Take care of it today. There's a rhythm and you want to kind of live your life in that rhythm. And we can sense that rhythm, can't we? Yeah, yeah. We can sense where we're in it. And then, of course, we can sense where we're not in it, when everything just seems to be going the wrong way. A little bit, the, the Tao, the returning to the Tao is really kind of living in harmony with life, living in harmony with nature, living in harmony with each other. There's this human drumbeat that sometimes one is, no, now, 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 you got to do it today, 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 now, 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 now. And we got to get out of that a little bit, because that drumbeat may be totally not in sync with the divine drumbeat. One of the gifts in my life has been the recognition of synchronicities. And mm -hmm. for me, that's the rhythm of my life. I've had situations in my life when I've been presented a choice, and I had three opportunities. I could either say, dismiss it out of hand, yes, that's interesting, but not right now, or yes, with a capital Y, and move forward. And every time I expressed that capital Y with one of those synchronicities, the next one would come, and the next one would come. And I'm very blessed yeah. in that way. Well, you've, you've trained yourself to live that way. Some people don't pay attention to that prompting. Or they let fear or other things get, what do you mean I should go do that right now? That's scary to me. You know, so there's, we got to have a little courage too. be willing to take some risks. It's okay to gamble every now and then. It's okay to take a risk. And even if you fall, you'll get back up again. And you'll be the better, you'll learn more. Or they say it's better to have loved than lost than never have loved at all. Because then you wouldn't have had the loving experience. What is transcendent consciousness, and how does this connect us with the divine? Well, this is another chapter we added in the book, because the book is very practical. It's teaching you about things about, you know, how to help in your career, your finances, and relationships. But is that really just only what the aura is about? And what we're trying to show there is, of course, these things are important, we need to take care of them, and they have an aura correspondence. But we're not here just for our jobs. We're not here just for making money. You know, that, there is, we're here as spiritual students in a school. And there's a bigger goal to get into the greater sensing of life, the fullness of life. The transcendent consciousness is this ability to step into a state of awareness, which is really beyond the physical sensing of things. And to realize that there is truly, through your own experience, there's an inner pulse beat of life that's going on right this minute as we speak. And we're all meant to be part of that, but when we're so immersed in the physical consciousness, we can forget it. You know, the East Indians had the philosophy of the Maya, the world of illusion. They weren't saying the world was an illusion. They were saying when you look at the world through the five physical senses and say that's all there is, that's an illusion because there's a bigger life. It's like looking at the electromagnetic spectrum and saying, no, only the visible light spectrum exists. Well, that's not true. And there's much more than just the physical life. And since we're not physical, as you build up your auric power, it becomes more and more enlightened. And the, literally, the whole shape of the auric can change once you get so much power into it. And then this can lead you into these higher states of awareness. My whole journey started by these kind of spontaneous experiences, which, again, I couldn't put any language or name to at the time, but told me, wow, there's something more going on here. What is your ultimate hope for human consciousness? Well, you know, I know people keep thinking, gosh, the world is getting worse right now. But 
we're certainly going through growing pains right now. But what the higher repeatedly shares is that, no, the world is getting better, not worse. And we are actually on the threshold of a major evolutionary upstep for humanity. And I don't mean technologically, and although that's kind of happening too, I mean spiritually. The fact that so many people are having these awakenings, and it's not coming from just one place in the world or one person or one group. It's like grass growing all over the planet. That is not accidental. So we actually live in an amazing time. If I were to leave with one message today, it would say, do everything you can to make your spiritual growth, your spiritual work, an even higher priority in your life. To which I say, amen. My guest, Dimitri Moritis, co-founder and co-spiritual director of the Spiritual Arts Institute and co-author of the updated 25th anniversary edition of Change Your Aura, Change Your Life. Dimitri, one more time, please share with our listeners where they can find out more about the Spiritual Arts Institute and get your books. Please visit us at spiritualarts.org or go on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, your local bookshop to find out more about our books. Dimitri, thank you so much for joining us and sharing this wonderful information. Thank you. It's my pleasure. And thank you for all the good work you're doing. Thank you, Dimitri. And thank you for joining us on Vox Novus. I'm Victor, the voice Furman. Have a wonderful week. 